welcome to our introduction to anonymization techniques for social science research data. I'm Christina Magder, the Data Collections Development Manager here at UK Data Service. I wear a little bit of two hats, I would say. Um, so I while I lead on the acquisition, the acquiring of new data collections, I also wear a research data management hat on, and it's all about supporting data creators in making their data available. So one of these being, how do we anonymize the data? Um, my colleague Maureen, senior research data officer, focused on qualitative data, sadly she can't make it today, um, and any more in-depth questions about Quality work, uh, by all means, please do add them to the Padlet and she will be answering those. And of course, I do want to make a, a, a huge call out to get in touch. Um, any questions or good questions, especially when it comes to anonymization, sometimes we need a lot of background information to be able to make informed decisions on what the best um, course of action would be for specific projects. So sometimes we might need, if we're talking about survey data, the questionnaires or the data dictionaries or both. Um, for qualitative data, actually looking at the topic guides, looking at the context of what you're actually trying to achieve and so on. So we are here to help with all of that. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, the data sharing mailbox is on the slides, just at the end of the slide, and you can always reach out to us. We can set up bespoke Zooms or Teams as well to have discussions that sometimes, well, Emails are great for some things, but sometimes just a, a chat via Zoom or Teams just works far better. So the format of the workshop today, we are having a structured overview of different anonymization techniques, as well as practical examples in the key considerations when we talk about anonymization. We are going to be using Mentimeter um, just to get to know each other a little bit, but also for some exercises and, and scenarios as well. And also, as I was mentioning, we are using this Padlet for Q&A because we really want to, to be able to answer all the questions while speaking in the allocated time of an hour and a half for this workshop. And we can go back to the Padlet to answer more questions. It is going to be open for 48 hours. We know, especially when there is so much content to take in, sometimes questions might come later on. And for straightforward questions, by all means, you can use the Padlet. I will now put in the chat both links for the Menti and for the Padlet for the Q&A session. And we're going to start with a very straightforward question, an introductory question. I can see the numbers still popping up. People are still joining us. How confident are you in your understanding of anonymization? You can either use the, the link in the chat or you can go to menti.com and use the code. The code is 64269281. That the link is probably more helpful. We just click it and we go. That's fantastic. We have quite a lot of people. Oh, it, it keeps moving. More people that are slightly confident, oh, follow very shortly by moderately confident. We have some people that are confident and a couple that are not confident. That's fantastic. It's all anonymous, so 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 share the truthfulness. Um, they're, 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 we're, we're not doing anything with this information other than trying to, to gauge your understanding of, of anonymization. And at the end, I am going to ask, how do you feel now about anonymization? Thank you all so much. And it's great that the main team is working. I always have the worry it might let us down. So today's program, this is an introduction to anonymization. So it's quite introductory in terms of the, of the topics that we're covering. We are starting with anonymization and the context of data because data doesn't exist in anonymization. In anonymization, in isolation, I meant. Um, data exists along its context. So it's very important when we think of anonymizing the raw data that we have, what else is out there? And even thinking about what publications we might do with the data besides just sharing that data, just journal publications or presenting at conferences and so on. We're going to be talking a little bit about our three-pronged approach for so social science primary research. How do we um, share as much data as possible, both from an ethical and legal point of view? What is the applicable legislation? 
and what are some wider considerations when we're thinking about this legislation? What are some types of identifiers? We're talking about effective anonymization and practical considerations. And here in the UK, we're actually most um, grateful to have ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, that provides a lot of information on how we can make our data available. Um, and this is not applicable to other European countries. I know European colleagues are quite um, envious um, of, our, of our context in the UK. What are some common indirect identifiers? And we're giving practical examples. So hopefully that will help you when you're actually anonymizing your data to look at the specific information and realize, oh yes, this is an indirect identifier. I want to share this data in this way. So I need to treat this specific information in a specific way. We're giving a brief overview of anonymization steps very straightforward. We've tried to make that as streamlined as possible. And it is applicable to both quant and qual. One of the reasons we've combined the session into quant and qual is because in practice, when we're talking about legislation, the types of identifiers, they are applicable no matter the, the type of data. So we hope that is a fail. But again, we encourage everyone to please complete our feedback at the end of the session. Um, that's the only way we learn and we can adapt the materials and, and provide with what is most needed for the community. We then go into specific anonymization techniques and considerations for quantitative data and for qualitative data as well. We have included a list of semi-automated tools that can be used for anonymization as well. And then we go into our Q&A. So the main focus is around the types of identifiers and the types of data. We are focusing on numerical data, so survey data, admin data, transcript data, and we're touching a little bit on audio and visual data as well. Sadly, we have limited time and there's so much information. Um, so it's all about what to look out for and why are we looking out for all of these different things and what techniques should you be using or what options are available. However, before going into all of this, Let's look at key data context definitions and the overall context in which data exists. So anonymization in itself, I'm just thinking in terms of the data, it's a fantastic tool that allows the data to be share, shared while protecting research participants. And as ethical researchers, that is our main focus. We do not want to do any harm. We do want to protect our participants. However, we must always appreciate that every data source in every data context is different, uh, some of them being extremely different than, than one another. So a number of key factors to consider are the types of identifiers, and we have direct and indirect, and we're going to be talking quite a bit about them, the types of data, but also ethical considerations. So we have informed consent. How do we protect the confidentiality of participants? How about withdrawal rights as well? But also data sharing strategies. So here we're talking about access control, so should we be protecting data more? Um, and realistically speaking, yes, the open science agenda is fantastic, but open science doesn't necessarily mean open data licenses. Sometimes we need to protect that data. Yes, all the outputs should be made available under standard open licenses, Creative Commons, for example. But when it comes to the data itself, the individual level data, sometimes we do need to protect that data by having specific end user license agreements in place, sometimes even protecting the environment in which that data is actually used. So going to data security. So the three-pronged approach to protecting participants is consent, anonymization, and access. So in terms of consent, and it's very important here, I'm not talking about consent from the legal point of view, just from the ethical point of view, letting participants know how their data is going to be used and for what purpose. Do we explain all the different types of data sharing? Uh, it's really important, again, from the ethical point of view, and we're going to, to talk very briefly about the different legal bases that are applicable because we are not using consent as a legal basis most of the time. Anonymization 
it's referring to treating the data in itself to actually minimize the risk of identification. And of course, one of the key challenges here is recognizing that data utility will be reduced when we're treating the data. So it's striking that balance. But this is where access comes into help because we can have very different versions of data that we make available. For example, I'm a quant researcher, so my examples are quite quant related. Um, we've collected a survey and we really want to make some data available as open access under a Creative Commons license. For example, we could make available aggregate data. We can make that available quite easily under an open license. But we also want to make available the individual level data because this is how secondary researchers are going to be able to conduct their research. So this is where we start thinking, who can access the data? How can they access the data? For how long should we have a user agreement in place? Or also, if we're talking about um, very detailed, rich, granular data, should we be actually leveraging legislation to help us share that data? Again, in the UK, we're very lucky having the five safe framework. And we're going to be talking about that in a little bit, but also legislation in terms of the Digital Economy Act, for example, which allows government departments to share the data for future reuse as well. Applying this combination of strategies actually allows for most data to be shared. Now, data protection considerations. Um, I did say in the UK, we're very, very lucky with the Information Commissioner's Office and all of the links um, are in the in the presentation. So once the presentation is made available, you can follow all the, all the different links uh, because they do provide in-depth information, not only about personal data, like definitions and, uh, and all of that, but considerations for anonymization. And it's fantastic that they're actually acknowledging this data spectrum. We're not talking about yes, no, personal, no, it's a data spectrum. So we need to treat different data accordingly, depending on what's included in it. When it comes to personal data, it is defined by the UK General Data Protection Regulation, UK GDPR, and also the Data Protection Act from 2018 as well. In a nutshell, personal data is information that relates to an identified or identifiable natural person. So we'll we're talking about humans, be it directly or indirectly. So this is the, the, the most important bit, I would say. So indirectly as well, we're not just talking about, about names in here. And also while taking into account other information derived from published sources. So here we're talking about that, that data context. We also have the context of special category data. Sometimes it's referred as sensitive data. And we're talking about data that needs some additional protections and some additional considerations. When we're collecting this data, for example, we must actually identify the specific legal basis for us to process that information as well. When we're talking about spe special category data, we're talking about data revealing racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetic data, biometric data, but also data concerning health in general, and also a person's life, sex, or sexual orientation. When it comes to personal information, um, and I've included this in here because from, from the different events that we've organized and different chats that we have with, with, with researchers, there's still sometimes confusion about personal data and personal information. We do have in the UK the Statistics and Registration Service Act from 2007 that defines personal information. And the difference between personal information and personal data is that personal information refers to corporate bodies as well. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a human. It can be, for example, an organization. So that's an extra consideration for us when we collect data about organizations. Now, when it comes to consent and participant communication, and again, this, this can be different um, depending on the on the methodology you're using. So for example, with longitudinal data, you have a lot more um, 
time um, as, the, as the sweeps or waves are coming to adapt and change the different protocols that you're using. Uh, but again, it's very important to make this difference between ethical and legal consent. In the UK, most organizations or public bodies and authorities do use public task for processing personal um, data. And to bear in mind, even when you're anonymizing data, you're anonymizing personal data, right? That is a processing activity. So if you are based, for example, at a university, NHS, UKRI, and all of that, it would be public task that you are using to process that information. If you are based at a non-public authority, most likely it is going to be legitimate interest. There are other legal bases there that can be used as well. Of course, you can use consent for processing personal data. You can use contract and so on. But there are better flexibilities when we are using public task or legitimate interest and also for data sharing, not only the, the processing activities. But again, the most important thing from an ethical point of view is to really let know your participants what will happen with their data. What is it going to be used for the project? What is it going to be used once the project concludes? How is that data going to be shared? And so on. We do have dedicated events on, on consent and ethical and legal considerations. All of those are on our event pages and we make available a lot of templates. Um, they're all under Creative Commons so you can adapt and reuse them as needed. Um, so by all means, please, please do make use of our, of our materials. And again, any feedback, if there is anything else you would, you would require, um, any different types of templates and so on, just please let us know and that's something that we can work on. Now, very briefly about access levels, because it's, it's difficult not to talk about all of this and just go into direct and indirect identifiers. Um, I'm giving the UK data service as an example, but this type of access options are actually applicable to most responsible repositories. Everyone offers this three, three or four, some of them have just a two, tiered approach to actually accessing data. At UKDS, we have open, safeguarded and controlled data. When we're talking about open data, we are here talking about data that is not classified, either as personal data or personal information. Or if it is classified as such, there needs to be proper consent in place for that data to be shared with the identifiable information. And that is something that could apply, for example, you are collecting semi-structured interviews from um, the elites, from key public figures. Um, they do most of the times like, like prefer to have their, their names included. Now, safeguarded data, this is suitable for most of the data collections that are collected from human participants because it is not classified as personal data or personal information. But besides treating the data, we are also applying an end user license agreement in place so that anyone else that uses the data to, does use it in an ethical way. Um, so, for example, that might be they're not going to share the data with anyone else. They are going to use it for their defined purposes. They are going to delete the data safely and securely at the end of the research so that it doesn't get lost or published somewhere that it shouldn't. There are some additional levels under the safeguarded option. Um, and we have, for example, sometimes uh, we have additional agreements that need to be put in place depending on what's in the data. It's still not personal, but maybe it's a little bit more sensitive and we do want to have some additional reassurances from our, from our um, secondary researchers. Um, all of that is controlled with the data depositor. So it's a discussion between us and any data owner that wishes to deposit data at UK Data Service, and we make an informed decision overall. Um, at the end of the day, as creators of the data, you are the experts on the data, and there might be situations where, for example, we might say, oh, safeguarded plus these additional conditions might actually be more useful. But then when you're, you're giving us more information about the data context and what's available or what's not available out there, um, that might change and just go to, to the safeguarded option. 
Finally, we have the controlled access level, and this is for data that's either classified as personal data or personal information. There are no direct identifiers in this data, so we, we don't have any names in this data. However, the richness and the granularity of the data, it's, well, far more than all, all, the, all the other access levels. This is why this data is made available via the Five Safe framework. Uh, so we protect actually the environment in which the data is being made available. We also protect the, the research that's going to be carried out. So we have safe projects. Researchers need to apply and demonstrate public good to be able to use that data. Safe output, so very important once you've done all of your research as a secondary researcher, the outputs are actually checked for secondary disclosure. So today we're focusing on input, raw data as it is, anonymization, but there's also the concept of output anonymization disclosure control. Now, types of identifiers, I hope that provides a, a, a bit of the context and, and, and puts all of this into the into the bigger picture. And again, I appreciate there's a lot of information, but everything will be will be made available. So you can go over the slides, reuse them as well. If that's something that you want to teach on, by all means please make use of our of our slides. Now, when it comes to identifiers, we have direct identifiers and indirect, and their names are saying what they are. Direct information that directly identifies participants or data subjects, and indirect identifiers that in combination, so we're talking about various information, when taken together, might identify a person. So let's do a short menti. And we're going to be giving more examples. Please do put your examples of direct identifiers on the menu. The code is yet again in chat. I can see a couple of more people joined. So hopefully everyone has the um has the link. Or if not, you can join just by going at menti.com and using the code 6426-9281. Um it is working. I always worry. Um, we have had a couple of sessions where Menti decided not to work. Um, it was probably me, not Menti. This is fantastic. Name, address, name, different names, date of birth, tattoo. We're starting to talk about multimedia data, audio and visual. That's fantastic. IP address, all types of addresses yes, that are, are, are uniquely linked. Uh, what else do we have? House number. Well, house number is an interesting one because is it just a house number? This person lives at house number num number two, as an example, but we don't have anything else. That is a very, very interesting one. Phone number, GPS coordinates, yes. And we have had collections where um, the latitude and longitude um, were left in, so we had to have discussions with the data owners. Those are really, really identifiable. Um, it's fantastic because address name date of birth, the, 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 the address and names are, are the biggest ones. Um, and date of birth, again, this is something that we're going to be discussing in indirect identifiers, um, because the date of birth on itself is not necessarily um, um, a direct identifier. I can see where you're coming from with potentially, but there's far more things that we can do with the date of birth compared to when we have a name or an address which goes to to, to pseudonyms, social security number, fantastic. Yes, all of the different numbers that are uniquely identified, um, fingerprint, biometric data, facial image, that's, that, that's fantastic. Again, multimedia data talking in terms of different unique physical appearances. So this is something that we're currently looking into when it comes to MRI data in medical images data, how do we actually ensure the anonymization of that type of data? No, thank you all, and I'm so grateful you are all um, participating in the Menti. That is fun. We love, a, we love an engaging audience. Um, how about some indirect identifiers now? So thinking of things that when put together, they're going to identify us. What makes us unique? Let's put it like that. Any any examples? There are plenty of examples when it comes to, to indirect identifiers. And actually, there's some um, literature. So when 
uh, an additional step to, to anonymization is statistical disclosure control, which is uh, machine assisted as well. And um, they separate the variables a little bit differently than the anonymization overall theory. And we have um, key variables. This contains the indirect identifiers um, and non-identifying variables. With the non-identifying variables, there's actually literature now that suggests, well, yes, they're not they're non-identifying in terms of, oh, you might ask me about what I'm reading and I might give you the name of a newspaper, but could they actually be considered an indirect identifier? Um, because they do reveal a lot of information as well behind the, the very top layer. Uh, that's fantastic. We have job title, age, health conditions, rare health conditions, political party affiliation, city, we're going into geography, occupation, country. Look at that geography. That's fantastic. Education, history, job title and company, place of work, company, personal information, That if, if it is the name, postcode and house number. Exactly. That's the full address, medical condition, employer name, again, personal information, if we're talking about organization information. Um, type of pet, well, I don't know if you have been inspired by the, the picture behind me. That is an interesting one. And if we go back to what I was saying about the, the statistical disclosure control, that would probably be defined as a non-identifying variable, the type of pet that someone has. But again, when taken with everything else, could that potentially be an indirect identifier? That is fantastic. No, thank you all. And again, so grateful you're, you're completing our mentees. It, it makes it far more enjoyable. Um, and do not forget about the Padlet for the, for the questions as well. I'll just put it in the chat again. Um, so do put your questions on the Padlet as well. So... Thank you all so much for the for the different examples. Those are fantastic. And when we think about direct identifiers, once again, we're thinking about information that directly identifies that person. And we had all of these examples. Um, I think even an HS number we had um, in the um, in the list. When it comes to indirect identifier, we've seen it's all about that combination. So we're talking about sex, age, region, occupation, income, ethnicity, religious affiliation, and all of that. There are things we can do to anonymize the data, the data itself. So now we're not necessarily thinking of the of the full full context. Now, something that we really want to make a difference um, it is terminology that we use, UKDS wide, is this difference between de identifying data and anonymizing data. Because de identifying data, we're talking only about removing or um, using pseudonyms, for example, for direct identifiers, so removing or masking them. All the indirect identifiers are still in there as collected. Very, very rich data, but this is personal data. Anonymization takes that a step further. So yes, we're working on the direct identifiers, but we're working on the indirect identifiers again. And sadly, is that data utility that needs to be put in balance because if we do a lot of anonymization, then potentially no one else can be using that data. This is where I'm going back to the access level sometimes most of the times, I would actually say it's better to have different versions, different access levels, so that more people can be using your data. Now, this is just putting it a little bit in practice. We, we start with the personal data onto anonymized data. Uh, data utility is going to be highest when we're talking about data that's just been de-identified. We have that, that granular information. And this applies to access controls as well. When we talk about that type of data, most likely we're going to be using the five safe framework. Other researchers, secondary researchers that want to make use of your data, they're going to be accessing it via a trusted research environment. Um, so it, they come download it onto their machine. They have to remote into a specific um, environment to use that data. And we have all the different other um, safes in place that we've discussed about the safe project, the safe outputs and so on. But there's no information loss because realistically, when we're talking about using someone specific name, right? What does that bring? With some exceptions, again, if we're talking about key figures and so on, but having that directly identifiable information doesn't actually give a lot of data utility. 
now. But having as much of the indirect identifiers still present in the data, so if we're talking about, for example, location, yes, we're not going to have the full address with the house number, but we are going to have the postcode. So we remove that house number, but we have the postcode, which allows for very granular um, analysis. Um, and of course, matching to different other data sources when acceptable. So pollution deciles and, and, and all of that. Now, effective anonymization, and again, I can't express how grateful we are in the in the UK for, for having ICO, uh, because it's a great concept. We are, again, thinking of the data in its full, full context. It's not just the, the piece of, I don't know, the CSV file I'm working on or the RTF um, interview transcripts that I'm working on. No, it's everything else. So do we have directly identifiable data? Do we have indirectly identifiable data? How unlikely is it for the data to be identified? And if it is impossible to identify, which again, we are usually talking about aggregate data um, rather than individual level data. There are very, very few scenarios where individual level data is impossible to identify, especially when we think of all the, uh, all the new technological developments. So, um, for example, AI. Of course, this becomes different when we're using this end-user license agreement and, and agreements, terms and conditions of use, um, because they can clearly um, say that online data tools, for example, with the, with the UKDS one, online data tools, including um, Gen AI or AI in general are um, prohibited online ones because we're we're transferring that data. When it's sandboxed and we're using such tools in full control, we can we're the only ones that can can access the data. We're the only ones that can delete the data and so on. That is different and it's acceptable. Now. Anonymization in practice, um, as I said, we, we, we're keen to give a lot of examples to make, to hopefully demystify anonymization as much as, as possible. So we start with the personal data. This is exactly what we've collected. It's all dummy information. We have not collected it, this data. But Anna Thompson, she, her, 45, went to her chemotherapy treatment on 5th of April 2020 at Bakersfield Hospital. This is the information that we have. Well, to de-identify that information, we are going to use a pseudonym for Anna Thompson, use Charlie, but leave everything else the same. Say, for example, we want to actually control access to that data because we know that secondary researchers are actually interested in the time frame of where the treatments happened. So we're always thinking of the context. We're thinking of reproducibility as well. Is this something that I'm already publishing in journals, at conferences and so on? So we can then have Charlie, she, her, 45, went to her chemotherapy treatment in April 2020. So we're only maintaining the month and the year at a hospital in Oxfordshire. So again, we're introducing some anonymization, but because we're going to be protecting the access as well, um, it's um, helping. Now, fully, um, uh, more fully anonymized, um, Charlie, 4554, went to her chemotherapy treatment in 2020 at a hospital in England. So again, we worked a lot on that geography. Now it's very general, England. We're just using the country rather than a region. We have banded the age. Now to bear in mind, and, and we're, we'll be talking about this in a, in a minute, when we're talking about different techniques that we apply to data, it's also important to understand that some of these techniques might not be able to allow data users to use specific tools for analysis. So if we're using banded ages, they're not going to be able to calculate the mean for example. And again, I do come from the from the quant. Um, oh, thank you so much. There are comments in the chat. Bear with me. I'm trying to, 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 to keep on top of everything. Um, so the Charlie, she, her, that would still be controlled within the, um, within the um, access controls. And the she, her can be important in terms of secondary data analysis. What um, 
text or the participants that are receiving this treatment, that it's a valid use for the data, but we need to control the context of where that data is made available. Um, exactly, exactly. It depends on what is needed by the researcher. Gender can be, can be very important to analysis. So this is why we're not thinking just in terms of that, of that data file or data files that we're working on. What else can we do to actually make as much data available as possible? And again, I can't, I can't stress enough. Multiple versions are totally fine. You can have some that are very, very anonymized. Therefore, a lot of that granular information is no longer available there, but it still has some usability where you can have some that are more detailed, but they're protected via via access controls. I will try to keep an eye on the chat as well as much as I can. Technology, technology is fantastic. Uh, so again, indirect identifier, the context does matter a lot. Um, and it's really important to plan anonymization from the beginning of your research project when you start thinking about collecting the data. Because again, are there sometimes situations where there's specific information you don't even need to collect? That's another consideration to, to bear in mind. And again, it's balancing the data utility with the information loss and thinking of those access controls as well. We take it overall rather than just focusing on the file. Now, as I said, we're giving some examples. Um, these are the key sociodemographics, um, agnostic of the type of data, be it, be it survey, admin, transcript data, that is usually available in the, in the information that we want to make available to secondary researchers so that they can make use of the data. Now, when it comes to age, in your original data, you might be collecting the full age, the the full date of birth. So it would have the, the day of birth, the month of birth, and the year of birth as well. Again, we're thinking of those access controls as well. What data can we make available at which access? Single year of age, so just having the age of uh, the year of birth, that's really important. And it is considered to be one of the most important demographic information in any, any data sources that are available. Again, really important to think, depending on what anonymization techniques you're using, are secondary researchers then unable to conduct some analysis? Is, for example, my journal article that I've just submitted not able to be reproduced because I did actually use the mean and they won't be able to do, to calculate the mean because I've banded the ages. And again, very important, the different version. Another key example is education, and we've seen that in your examples as well. Uh, you all know very well anonymization to begin with, but I, I hope the context is helpful as well. So in terms of education information, we might have the highest level of education, their field of study, their duration of the study, the type of institution that they've attended. Um, and again, we're talking about taking this information with other information that's available in the data files that we've, we've collected. Uh, this information, when taken all together, could be unique and might as well um, identify a specific person um, and lead to the re-identification of participants. Wherever possible, um, information about education should be categorized using a coding frame. And we do link to um, available um, coding frame. The ONS Census 2021 is the most recent one. Uh, this is not only helpful from an anonymization perspective, but this is helpful from a harmonization and standardization perspective as well, using pardon me, using the standardized coding frames. And this can be applicable to um, transcript data because we've seen a lot of people, yes, we can use them in, in our survey data, we can categorize our admin data. No, this can be used in our um, qualitative transcript data as well. Employment, again, very important variable. Just removing that variable, you're not doing anyone, uh, or different variables, you're not doing anyone a service. You might have occupation classification, their job role and their title, uh, their type of work, the employment sector, where are they working, the industry sector, and also the employment time, full-time, part-time, and so on. 
all of this information, again, when put together, might lead to the re-identification of an individual. So what can we do? Again, I'm going back to the fantastic standard classifications that ONS are making available. All of them are linked. So do have a look at them. And again, there might be specific information that we can make available as safeguarded access. So we're thinking um, still controlled, but less controlled way of um, using the data or some information might have to go under the controlled access of proper trusted um, research environment where all the five saves apply. Income. And again, this is something that in most of the data that we, we have, income does um, does come out well, specifically for quant. Um, Paul, there are quite a few studies that do have income information, and this could take different various forms. Um, income in terms of the, the raw income that they're getting, ranges, what types of savings do they have, how much savings, what type of debt do they have, how much debt do they have, and so on. Again, isolated cases, either very low or very or very high. We are talking about outliers here. Um, a large lottery win, for example, on earned income. Well, that can be quite identifying, especially now with all the lotteries post posting pictures of the winning people and so on. So all financial information needs to be really carefully considered. And again, it's very very dependent on what else is available on the data and what you need to make available. Very similarly to age, if, for example, we're just doing banding of, of income, say one of one of the things that we're asking them is about income and we decide to use banding, again, they're not going to be able to calculate that mean, which is needs to be an informed decision. Is that going to affect reproducibility? How is that going to affect future reuse? And at UKDS, we, we see it on a daily basis. Some data is originally collected for X purpose, and then it's actually used for A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So the more data that can be made available, the better. And again, this is where we're talking about that three-pronged approach. Uh, geographical information. Again, very important to have some geographical information in, in the data, but geographical information also increases the risk of disclosure, that risk of identifying a participant. You might have countries, regions, county, town, local authority, more specific geographical characteristics such as health area, postcode sector, postcode district, the full postcode, the grid references, so people can actually drag it and drop it on the map, and latitude and longitude. All examples that have been in the indirect, um, I think all of them have been in the indirect menti, so that's fantastic. You you already know what you're working with, but what do we do about it? Again, this is very important to consider the overall study, what is your sample size, and what the individual data rows you are anonymizing and how. Say, for example, you have conducted a study in a specific town. That information is already known, even if you would not be including it into your uh, files, right? That information is known via the outputs that you're publishing, uh, pre-registration that you've done, um, via the project that actually funded the work and so on. So we need to think what's out there and what we make available in the data. Uh, it is advisable for any geographical information more detailed than region, so anything that goes off the region, like county, town, LA, to actually have stricter access controls in place. Because again, we're talking about how are we um, able to make sure that our participants are not being identified. If we're providing very, very granular geographical information, they most likely will be able to be identified with a lot of work. I'm not, it's not going to happen overnight, but they might as well be able to be identified. Another key thing that we do find in a lot of collections that we receive are dates of life events. So marriage, adoption, divorce, date, um, date of death, death um, treatment dates, but also court appearances as well. Now, to bear in mind, some of these dates might be made available online somewhere else. So most of the time, reducing the exact date to month and year might be sufficient. sufficient. Sometimes we might actually just have to drop to year only. 
especially I'm thinking now of the court appearances, if it's something very specific, we might need to do the year rather than doing the, the month in year. That might still be way too disclosive, even with some standard like the safeguarded access in place when we have that ter terms and conditions. Now, it is really important to assess how the information is going to be of use to secondary researchers. As for all the other ones, if I'm removing this, is reproducibility still allowed? Or are they going to be able to use the data for X and Y and Z? And again, access control comes into place. Um, ethnicity, national identity, and religion. Again, very, very important. Um, and it's important to make when when collected, it's important to make this data available as well in in as much detail or as less detail as possible um, and as needed. Um, similar to the education and occupation, for example, using standard coding frames is really advisable. Um, we do have the, the link from ONS. Again, ONS are fantastic with making available the standardized schemas and classifications for the different information that we want to make available. And again, it's not only from an anonymization perspective, but using standardized schemas shows your openness to harmonization and standardization across different data sets and across different countries as well. Because with all of these schemas that are made available, a a lookup table can be created from example from these are the ones that are used in the UK and these are the ones that are used in France or Netherlands. Um, and that lookup table actually allows for cross-disciplinary, cross-border um, research as well. Um, some additional sensitive information, so political opinion, trade union membership, genetic data, health data as well. Uh, do always make sure that you check whether you include um, any sensitive information. If you include any sensitive information, again, that access control should be considered. Um, there are things that you could do, for example, um, when talking about health, again, using coding schemas to actually have categorized health conditions, but you won't probably want to make that data available as just standard open access, um, especially when it's combined with socio-demographics. So I'm not talking about aggregate data. Aggregate data is perfectly fine, but the individual level raw data. Now, once again, really important, we are talking about combination of information, looking at the entire row or the entire transcript or the entire file that you want to make available. What is available in there that when put together might identify a person? So let's do a participant profile exercise. Imagine that you have this row in some survey data that you've collected, or maybe it's in a transcript um, and you can extract this profile. So we have participant A, um, age 21. We have the date of birth, um, 12th of March, 2002. Um, ethnic group, mixed, multiple ethnic group, white and Asian. Um, national identity, British. They have a PhD in computer science and informatics. Um, they are a senior cybersecurity specialist at Tech Secure LTD. Uh, they have one year and four months of employment in their current organization. We have their exact salary, 74, 271 pounds, and we have their postcode as well. Now, think about, um, you want to ensure when you share this data, that analysis of career progression in the UK at a region level um, is still possible. So years of employment, highest level of education and occupation are really important, right, to allow that. Which identifiers might you change and why? I shall start the menti. It should prompt, it doesn't appear in my um, presentation, but on the page of the menti, it should appear with the nice participant profile as well. What would you do in that case? Yes, impressive CV for a 21-year-old. To make sure that is made up, the postcode as well um, is made up. Uh, did base it on my personal postcode, but it's made up as well. Everything is made up. I'll just post the the menti link as well, because I never know with this chat. Hopefully, things don't disappear. But as you can see, I, I, I'm wary of technology sometimes. Uh, what is it doing?
So which identifiers might you change? How would you change them and why? And after this, we are talking about different anonymization techniques as well, both for quant, both for qual, um, why we use them, when we use them, and, and so on. Oh, yeah, they all appeared. See, I always forget to click. Um, give you the answers. Uh, PhD field, yes, the job title, the specific salary. Replace job title in employer info with category standard schema. Yes, fantastic. Um, unlikely to get a PhD at 21. This is really good because we're going a little bit into data quality at one point as well. Might be possible, but again, that's quite an outlier if it would be real. That's fantastic. The postcode, the date of birth, date of birth coming up again, the job title. That's those are fantastic, fantastic answers. Um, and I am so grateful we are getting engagement via the Minty, um, because that's the that's the whole point to start thinking about that. Now, in terms of what we might do, and it really makes what you were saying, uh, potentially looking at age banding if we really want to make that data available as widely as possible. Again, we won't have that mean available in there. The ethnic group, the ethnic group in our example is really, really specific. We can use the coding schema, the standard coding schema to actually have mixed multiple ethnic group as well. What if, however, the data usability in here. So again, for consideration, national identity, just saying British, British, highest level of education, as you've said in the responses, just leaving PhD, removing that field. But again, there's that question of 20 to 25 having a PhD. Occupation, as you've said, using the SOC 2020, the information technology professionals, um, and there's a code for it, code 213. Years of employment, if we're really interested in using that that or we've used it in our own paper and we want to ensure reproducibility, we might leave that as one year and four months. Um, salary ranges, and then we've talked about region. It's really important to do it on a region level. So what you've published is, is region level rather than rather than um, country level. So we've put that as the region east of England compared to the to the specific postcode. Um, it was a made-up Colchester postcode. We are based in, in Colchester here, here at um, UK Data Archive. Now, in terms of anonymization steps, we are talking about three main steps. We, are, we still have the data context and everything here. But in terms of the data itself, when I'm sitting right in front of the data, what do I need to do? Well, first, finding and assessing identifiers, both direct and indirect. What kind of direct identifiers do I have? What kind of indirect identifiers do I have? Then starting to think what anonymization techniques I'm going to use. And once we've done all of that, it's really important to actually review the data and reassess any other remaining risk of disclosure. So it's not just I'm doing it, forgetting about it. No, actually having a look and seeing what else do I need to do. Now, anonymization techniques for numerical data, before making any changes, again, make sure that they're made along data sharing plan so we know how we're going to be shared the data, with whom, under what access conditions, and so on. And always avoid under or over anonymization. Depending on that access level that you're using, you might need to do less anonymization on the data or more anonymization on the data. The most common anonymization methods for quant numeric data, we have recoding, banding, top and bottom coding, and generalization. Now, these are applicable to survey data, to admin data, anything that comes in a, in a tabular format, so to say. When it comes to recoding or categorization, they go by, by, by both names. Um, it's about reducing the number of distinct categories, right, in a variable. So we see the ethnicity on the left-hand side, very detailed. On the right-hand side, we've reduced that granularity by just having the very top level um, ethnicity categories from the standard schema so that we ensure standardization and harmonization as well. Um, and yes, it does depend on the research focus when we're thinking about how we anonymize. So again, is that context. It's really, really important to think what type of data I've gathered, how am I going to make outputs available? What types of outputs I'm going to make available? How 
am I actually promoting reproducibility when I'm sharing the data? So yes, it is all dependent on the on the research focus as well when we talk about anonymization. Banding or binning, again, these are usually applicable to continuous variables. So we're talking about age and income, and it involves categorizing these variables into broader ranges or bands, income being one, one key example when it comes to this, but it would be applicable realistically to all the different um, financial uh, information. So whether it's depth, whether it's any other um, income information um, and so on, age as well. Top and bottom coding. So top and bottom coding is really important when we have outliers in the data, sometimes very useful for data quality as well checks because you might be collecting data from people that are aged 18 and over. And when you do your distributions, you discover that you have someone that's in their 14. Um, so it, it, it comes in handy for multiple things. Um, so say, for example, we have ages, regular standard ages. In my example, we have someone that's 118. Um, probably there is no one that's 118. It's a very um, uh, worst um, case scenario. Uh, we can actually ban that to 80 plus, again, still allowing usability in terms of um, for example, life during retirement, if your research focused on that, you still want to have those um, um, top and bottom coding in a way that allows for secondary researchers to conduct the research they should be conducting, uh, rather than just simply, for example, banding over 50, like just... Um, just a random number. Generalization, and why I'm talking about generalization when we're talking about numerical data, um, and again, this is a, a, a common technique for transcript data, but a lot of the surveys do have open-ended questions. And from experience of the data that we are receiving, most of the times, a lot of the disclosure risk actually comes from the open-ended questions. Because you're asking someone a question, and sometimes they provide far more information than the question that asked them. So for example, the original detailed response is, I'm responsible for leading the cybersecurity initiative, spe specifically focusing on blockchain technology security and data encryption techniques. Now, if we think of all the other variables that would be available in a survey like this, that is, quite identifiable. So we're better off generalizing this, this textual information into involved in IT security and data protection. That is quite general. Again, if we want to do the standard coding schemas, but that would mean changing the type of variable. So that's another decision that can be taken. How about qualitative data? What are some considerations and techniques that we use for qualitative data? Now with qualitative data, survey data is much more straightforward. Um, qualitative data is even more challenging. Um, and we do need to give consideration, um, especially in terms of the informed consent that we've used. What did we actually say to participants? What type of data is going to be shared and how? And of course, trying to find that balance, because if we remove a lot of the information or most of the information that can be used for secondary analysis, that data doesn't have uh, usability anymore. No one's going to be able to use it. Um, if you're redacting too much, too little, however, then that data might be identifiable. Therefore, you have not done what you've agreed with your participant in your informed consent process. So striking that balance. Um, in terms of techniques with direct identifiers, um, when it comes to transcript data, we do encourage everyone to use pseudonyms rather than just redacting or replacing with um, sometimes um, data researchers blank out the names, um, actually using pseudonyms, fake names and fake details. So for example, someone that I have um, Joe blogs that went to Hogwarts, as the best um, example I came with, we would change Joe Blocks to Smithy Smith, for example, and Hogwarts to 
that's a made-up school anyways, but another made-up school name. Um, and it's important to be, con uh, to, to, be um, to be using the same pseudonyms across the, the project. So in the outputs as well, um, we were just having a discussion just the other week around this, how important it is to do this anonymization, to plan your anonymization from the beginning. And we're going to see an example of an anonymization plan so that when we share the, our outputs when we publish in, in journals, where we do a, a presentation at a conference, we're actually using the same pseudonyms we're going to be using when we're sharing that data via a responsible repository. Indirect identifiers, we are talking about categorizing and generalizing that information. And again, we can use standard schemas as well. Um, and a lot of, of, of data owners do that. Um, they prefer to use standard schemas. It makes it easier for secondary researchers to use that type of information. Now, categorization, that ser serves as an efficient strategy to preserve the utility of the data. So very similar as we've seen with the quant, say, for example, you're um, asking them about their ages and so on, but it would be a bit too much to make the raw age available. So you can actually ban that 20, 25 years, putting it in brackets. It clearly demonstrates that you have actually worked on that data and you have categorized it. Generalization. We're talking about uh, specific details being replaced with broader concepts. So, for example, living in a small village near the town of Blackburn in Lancashire, that's very, very detailed. Again, just made up. No one has said that in any data. Um, to actually changing that to living in a rural area in northwest west of England, it still allows geographical um um, analysis. So it's very important to actually preserve as much of the information as possible. What are some best practices? Anonymization plans. And we're going to see uh, an example in a second. Also using find and replace. And there are a lot of tips and tricks. So for example, using advanced search options and using wildcards. Um, for single characters, we use the question mark and we use the asterisk for multiple to actually catch all the different types of, of, of permutation. So we're talking here about capitalization, punctuation, and pluralization. Um, now with AI um, or AI assisted, let me put it like that, tools, there is actually um, more more tools that can be used and, and some that are more user friendly. And as I said, we have a slide dedicated on the different tools that you might want to explore. They are um, locally deployed, so they would be on your machine. You're not sharing that data with anyone else. It's also best practice to identify changes with brackets. So to actually make sure that the secondary researchers are understanding that that information was changed. So this is an example anonymization plan. Um, it is very um, light touch, I would say. Um, so we are replacing the name of the participants. I do apologize, Murphy's Laws. I, I have to present something and then I, I, I can't breathe anymore. Um, so we're replacing Lucas Roberts with Ken. That's going to be our pseudonym for our participants. We're actually only including the date of birth as the year of birth. We're no longer reta retaining the 2nd of May. Location, we're actually keeping the North Cumbria. Uh, we're not retaining the town as well. And again, making sure that if we are replacing Lucas Roberts with Ken, we are actually replacing all the Lucases with Ken. Because um, and it, it, it can happen, we have seen it in the past where it was changed at the top level and then in the in the transcript, um, the, the original name appeared. So this is where find and replace. It is fantastic. And in this case, we would be looking for Lucas Roberts, Lucas Roberts, all the different types of combinations as well. Now, uh, a good case study from our end, um, and it's, it's a bit different because we do have um, consent for the personal data to be shared as well. We're talking about well-known social researchers, pioneers of social research. Um, you can check out the study for yourself, 66226. Um, the interview topics did cover, they were very in-depth 
um, and cover events and details that could be easily cross-referenced for, for disclosure. Um, and data sharing had to be facilitated via clear consent to archive the personal data for future reuse in discussions with participants on what does that mean for them and so on. However, there was still some anonymization to be done because when we're talking about anonymization, we're talking from the full ethical point of view. Would, for example, an interview with someone put someone else at risk, as an example, um, a risk of harm, um, defamation risk, and so on. So even for a study where consent to share the personal data was in place, we there was still a need to anonymize some of the information, of course, with the participant consent as well. Now, when it comes to image and audio data, transcript data wasn't um, wasn't complicated enough. It's it's even more complex. So under legislation, when we're talking about the image of someone, their likeness, their, their, their um, recording of their voice as well, that is personal data. <clears throat> Can modify such information, but again, what is the usability loss in that case? Because say, for example, I am doing a, 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 a research study into the pitch when someone, I don't know, someone from specific different um, regions in the UK are pronouncing some different words, as an example. Um, if I'm changing the pitch to anonymize the information so that the voice is no longer personal data, the usability loss is horrendous. And it, it should make one wonder was it actually worth it to do it like that? When it comes to image and audio data, it is usually better to actually discuss with your participants. At first, try to assess what are the benefits of sharing the data as collected. And there are situations where there are benefits and that is perfectly fine. But discuss with your participants about this is what we would like to do with the data. Would you be happy with this? And so on. We do have collections um, for image and audio data where consent to actually uh, make that data available for reuse was made available. Of course, um, if you do need to anonymize it where possible, avoid it, or advise them to avoid wearing or saying any, anything which directly identifies them, be aware of identifying context. So we actually hear in the mint in the tattoos, yes, tattoos, jewelry, identifiable background as well. Um, when you're working with the data, again, we're talking about locally deployed on your computer. So not uploading that data somewhere that might be unsafe. Of course, you could be using as well um, institutional cloud services. Those are really protected. Um, and institutions take a lot of steps in ensuring that that data is not further, further, share, further shared. And of course, where possible, do user testing to check that any blurring or modification cannot be undone through resharpening. Um, there was actually a very interesting article where they managed to do a lot of de-blurring uh, from blurred images. So it's really important to check whatever you have done is not actually undoable. Another concept that I wanted to bring to your attention is this intruder testing. Um, and the intruder testing has usually been used for quant data, uh, but Maureen and I were, were talking, there is no reason for which it can't be used for qualitative data as well. It's basically trying to find these friendly intruders um, to try to see if they're able to re-identify anyone in the data set. Yes, it must be done under specific agreements, um, so we can't just ask someone from the street and they need to sign different types of non-disclosure agreements and so on. But it is something to consider, especially when we're talking about large volumes of data. So with longitudinal, uh, longitudinal collections in the UK, a lot of data owners do conduct intruder testing to ensure that the data that they're they're making available under different access levels is actually anonymized and it works fantastic we have put the links to where you can find more guidance about this now time for a couple more quick mentees and we'll go into our q a shortly as well we are just doing a bit of a of a regroup based on what we've heard. 
Which of the following techniques are appropriate for anonymizing transcript data? Hopefully, this it, it does work. Again, that is my worry with Mentimeter. That's that that's great. Leave it for a couple of minutes. I did put the Menti code again in the chat, and we will be using it for I think three slides. So you can you can leave it open for now, and I'll just add the Padlet as we're waiting the responses. All options. That is fantastic, and this is what we were expecting. That is great. How about continuous variables then? Continuous variables. Recoding, banding, or generalization. Oh. Banding. Fantastic. That is, is hopefully working, but you already knew so much to begin with. Um, I have seen it in your examples. The examples have been fantastic. Um, so when considering data sharing, what are the main approaches to ensuring participants are protected? There is one correct answer. I think only one option is correct. Fantastic. It is all three. Um, it's a tricky one because you might think you can select all of them, but no, it was just the one. It is all three. We're starting with the consent from the beginning. We go on to anonymization and also on to access control. That's fantastic. And thank you. Thank you all so much for participating in the Mendes. Um, as I've said, we have further resources, a lot of different things to read, but I can't stress enough, please, please get in touch. So we have the data sharing mailbox, data sharing at ukdataservice.ac.uk. It's on the last slide as well. Just get in touch with the different project queries you might have, because again, anonymization is in theory can be very different than anonymization in practice. And sometimes, as we were we were discussing earlier, we might need to see the data dictionaries, the co questionnaires, the topic guides, the different type of metadata that you might have an, available, for example, in a in an audio file or in a video file, and so on. Also, semi-automated tools. So these are not um unbreakable um they still need a lot of human consideration at the uk uh uk data service for example for numerical data we are keen fans of sdc micro it's an r package so all three nothing to pay nothing to pay for it and it does offer a user-friendly interface as well uh, done via shiny all you have to do in the r interface there are three lines of code to call the library open uh, install the library call the library and then um use the 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 function to actually call the interface and you can upload the data and i'm saying upload the data because it's still on your local machine it doesn't go absolutely anywhere so it's it's all safe we do also have qa my data which is a a, a free tool that we've developed at ukds um, and it's actually a health check for numeric data so you can even check for example if you have all the variables labeled well enough but you can also check for outliers. Um, we're using regex, regular expressions, to check for direct identifiers. You would have to give the regular expression that you're after. So for example, I want to check in all of my files, do I have any postcodes or any phone numbers? Those can be given as a regular expression and it checks for it. There's also ARCs in new Argos, again, for numerical data. I, we know that other data repositories and data owners are using those tools. They're very easy. We're just fond of SDC Micro. Um, everyone has a particular um, tool uh, that they like more. When it comes to qualitative data, we do have um, QualiAnon which is developed by Quali Service. We also have the text anonymization helper tool that we make available on our, on our web pages. Uh, it's simply a word macro 
that searches for anything with a capital letter or with numbers in it. Um, so it helps with the original, um, the identification of the data when it comes to direct identifiers. It doesn't change the data, it simply highlights it. Um, so you know where, where the changes need to be uh, uh, applied. We have text wash as well, Fantaforce and DID. These are actually much newer tools. Uh, people are still playing quite a little bit with them. Uh, named entity recognition there is something that is catching a lot of traction, especially when combined with other um, AI tools. So oh, thank you so much. We're, we're, we're getting great uh, um, feedback in the um, in the chat, and please do complete the feedback uh, um, once the once the webinar ends, because this is how we can learn how to how to adapt our training and and do other different training sessions. Um, well, I said at the beginning, um, very briefly, uh, one take one take too long, and then we go into the Q and A. How confident are you in your understanding of anonymization now? Are you more confident? Um, that's fantastic. We're getting moderately confident, confident, very confident. This is great. Look at how it changed. This is so reassuring. And I'm so, so happy, so happy to see that. And again, please, please do get in touch. Like I can't stress enough. Um, anonymization is complex. Um, and sometimes it might just even be passing ideas. Oh, have you considered this? Or have you considered that? That is truly, really, really helpful. Um, and again, it's an open discussion between yourselves as the data experts and ourselves as a, as a data service infrastructure on trying to make the, the, the best decision. Now, this is fantastic. We're getting more slightly confident and moderately confident and confident and very confident than at the beginning. So this is fantastic news. Um, it has certainly, it has certainly made my day. Um, Please do not worry. At the beginning, you felt overconfident, and now with the different um, contextual information, this became a bit more complex than it seemed at the beginning. It's perfectly, perfectly normal, and all the materials will be made available, so you can go over them at your speed as well. We have all the different information about the, how do we treat specific identifiers and so on. Um, and again, just please, please reach out um, because it's. Um, it's really important to, to have a chat. We do still have, I do like to talk, but we do still have 12 minutes in the schedule. So I'm going to go onto the Padlet um, because there are a lot of questions and that is fantastic. Um, and I will put the data sharing mailbox in the chat now. Any questions at all, please do reach out. I cannot type while I am talking, data sharing at ukdataservice.ac.uk. Any project specific questions, please do get in touch. Um, I'm, I'm giving that mailbox in case some of the colleagues might be away. Um, it's easier, it's easier to coordinate. Um, Anonymous versus synthetic data. We've actually had a, a fantastic and, and again, great engaged audience about synthetic data yesterday. It was focused very much for um, researchers, um, well, data professionals working in trusted research environments because there is usability for synthetic data. We have our colleagues, Dr. Jules Kassmeyer, she's a synthetic data expert. We mustn't see synthetic data as um, completely replacing anonymized data by no means. Synthetic data is an additional type of data that can be made available. There is also a lot of need for the real data to be made available. Um, all of those event um, materials will be made available on the event page as well. Uh, so you can you can have a look at that as well. And if you're interested in synthetic data as well, please do get in touch. Um, we're interested to hear more about more about people um, in, in synthetic data. Um, there are some, we can go on to the questions a little bit, trying to keep up with, with all the different chats in, in, in Padlet as well. There are some health data classified as sensitive, e.g. some NHS data. Would you be able to clarify the definition or how this is different from special category data or directly identifiable data? So this would still be special category data. Um, under UK GDPR, anything that has to do with um, health information um, so or biometric information as well is special category. We're just saying it's sensitive from a um, uh, disclosivity and sensitivity perspective. So say, for example, um, you've collected information without health, you've just collected 
um, the occupation of someone, their age and their gender, and for example, what is their, what are their hobbies, right? There's nothing sensitive in there. We're just talking about what is the occupation of someone, what is their age, and that they might like to read a book or play a video game or watch telly and so on. When we're talking about sensitive data, I'm going back to the to the intruder scenario. In Real intruders, not the friendly ones, would actually be motivated by that. Because especially when we're talking about NHS data, there could be information that no one else but the participant knows. So it could be um, status of specific conditions. We have had situations where, for example, we had HIV status that is very sensitive. And you can see intruders, people that want to identify other people, actually quite keen to find out that information. So it's always in the back of your mind thinking, OK, so if someone malicious would be to access this data, what could they do with the data? And that's when the access control comes in. Uh, yes, all the slides will be shared, uh, and I'm going to be typing the the answers to the questions as well. Probably it might have to be at the end of the week. Um, we're doing a couple of more um, training events this week, but I'll, I'll make sure I type in the, the answers to any Padlet questions. And any questions that come up, say, today or tomorrow, please do include them on the Padlet. I'm going to leave it open so everyone, everyone can still contribute. When pseudonymizing names, any suggestions about how to choose pseudonymized names? Name can suggest participant backgrounds. Uh, is it recommended to use a similar name, which might suggest similar background or a completely different name or depending on the study? Sadly, it is depending on the study. And um, I would say it's actually a discussion with the participant as well, um, because I couldn't go into the care and fair principles as well, because we only have an hour and a half available. Um, the fair principles are really well known, and it's all about findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. The care principles are specifically for indigenous communities, um, and there is a whole discussion there on actually using pseudonyms that do relate to the community, and the participants are very happy with that. So that might be a little, if you're doing a project, for example, doing a little bit of public engagement as well as part of your proposed bid to try to see what is the um, the best way forward for your own study. It does sadly depend on, on one study to, to another. Um, I got another question before this question. It just appeared. Um, and again, I will type all the answers because I realize we only have six minutes. Um, waiving anonymity. Is it OK to ask respondents to waive their anonymity in every survey? We don't know for sure we will use the data, but it would be good to capture as we are wanting to increase the value of our data to be able to use it for specific pension schemes. Or should survey always be anonymous? It truly, truly depends. And now, it depends what you mean by waiving their anonymity, because realistically, would you want to include their names in the data that you're making available or in the outputs that you're making available? Most likely no, because those names do not contribute a lot. A lot. What type of information would you want to include? Um, is it, for example, that you want to maintain their job titles? I'm thinking in terms of the pension schemes. It's not something that I have background in, but is the is the thing that came to mind. Maybe you want to include their specific job titles in the information at the very beginning of the survey. It's really advisable to let them know what information will be made available. So you could even explain in this case, because we want to make this data available for um, future research that encourages um, uh, data researchers to find out more about pension scheme information and so on. Actually, including that information in there would be would be really really useful. Um, some oral historians might be interested in making names available. Yes, that is a good argument, um, but we're also trying to balance the protecting participants. And again, it depends what type of information you are collecting during that survey. Is there anything that could be potentially very sensitive if we're including the names? So again, it differs from one project to another one. But very, if you want to get in touch with us about what type of information you're, you're actually collecting, do, do please get in touch with us. Um, and we can, we can have a discussion on that as well. But that's a very good point about the oral historians that might as well, uh, make use of the, of, of names as well in the future. Um, 
we have, this is probably a question for the consent training, but is it recommended to obtain separate consents for data disclosure by different identifiability, e.g. consent for sharing their data in anonymized format, consent for sharing their data in the identified format? Yes, as granular consent and information you can have as possible. Um, and it actually encourages participants to, to, to be open because they know, oh, I can share all of this, but I've chosen, for example, for only my um, anonymized data in this way to be shared. So I'm going to have my, um, I don't know, job title categorized and I'm going to have my age banded or there might be some that realistically they're fine with their data being just de-identified and made available under a, under a controlled environment. So by, by all means. Um, how to anonymize data when conducting arts-based research methods. Um, again, this comes a lot from, from that consent um, and it depends on what you're actually gathering. Um, and I am going to have my colleague Maureen, who is the qual expert, uh, come back with a far better answer to that. Uh, when it comes to quant, I can handle that qual. Uh, I am I am I'm still learning myself. Um, I am just looking. See Padlet, that is something I will have to look in the um, settings of Padlet because the questions just go from one, one place to another. So I don't know which one I was at. Um, is it correct that if we ask people to waive their anonymity, we need to tell them what we would use the survey data for? Yes, you need to inform them of what the data will be used for. We do have um, a participant information sheet information, um, consent form template, and a statement for service well on our website uh, on the research data learning, uh, research data management learning hub, all of that is available. And if you'd like us to check the information that you're making available, drop us a line and uh, we have our, our colleague Hina Vahid that leads on the ethical ethical component and she can advise on wording as well. So, so please do reach out. Um, how can we work together with the research participants in order to reduce their concerns about the use of their personal information in our research. Um, I would also keep in mind that participants may not always be aware of the different ways in which they could be anonymized. Yes, and this is really important. Why, depending on the participants that we're engaging with, what type of phrasing and wording are we using? This is a key um, um, philosophical to a degree discussion of actually participants understanding how their data is going to be shared and how their data is going to be anonymized and who's going to be using the data and for which purpose. Um, a key example that always comes to mind to this because it's, it's eye-opening even for those working in data infrastructures. We, we want to have these discussions with researchers and understand and, and try to address all of the concerns. A few years ago, it was it was before the pandemic, so it must have been five years ago, if not more than that. We've done a workshop. Um, there was a big call, um, ESRC funded people researching migration. Uh, so there were a lot of interviews conducted conducted with different migrants, um, and a lot of data owners argued that the migrants wouldn't have understood how the data is going to be shared, uh, wouldn't understand anonymization, and therefore they haven't even checked if they wanted that data to be shared. One of the one of the participants in the workshop was a migrant that came to share their 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 own experiences from their point of view directly live in that event, uh, face to face event. Uh, it was before the pandemic, um, and they were so keen on please everyone just share my data. I want everyone to know about what happened to me. Uh, this is the only way to produce policies that will not only help me but will help my children and will help my family and so on. So. It's, it's best to always leave all of your assumptions behind and actually have an open chat with the participant. Again, if you're doing a, a, a proposal from the start, having that initial engagement as well, piece of work is really important. You can do public engagement as well to see how people are feeling about different, different data sharing options and so on. Um, we have legal basis for processing data. Uh, Christina mentioned that task uh, in public interest can be used not only for processing personal data, but also for sharing research data. This implies that researchers might be able to bypass obtaining informed consent. Is that right? This is where we make that difference between legal basis 
and ethical consent. So not talking about legal consent. You would use consent as processing personal information very rarely, sometimes for special category data as well. But for special category, especially when it comes to universities, they usually use the archiving exemption, so they wouldn't be using consent for that, can be used, but they wouldn't be using consent for that. It's still very, very important to use the ethical consent. So just letting them know you're still processing that information on public task, but you're using consent to be an ethical researcher and letting them know what will happen to their data. How is the legal basis applied in practice? This wasn't classified during the ethical and legal guidelines in data sharing sessions. Thank you so much for that. It's something that we can add. Um, so again, all feedback, please do let us know. So depending on the legal basis that is being used, there are different um, rights that apply. So for example, the the right to be forgotten um, doesn't apply to public task, but the right to um I am missing the word, I think after an hour and a half of talking, I do not have my words with me. Um is not the right to complain. Um, I can't remember the wording. This is terrible. I do apologize. But the right for them to get in touch and say, I would like my data to be withdrawn still remains. However, with public tasks, we're thinking in terms of making sure that that data is made available now in a hundred years from now, in a thousand years from now, hopefully. Uh, so this, this is the main thing, is the different rights that apply to the different, to the different legal basis. Um, I will um, add answers to the Padlet, because I realize we've gone over three minutes. Um, please, please do let us know in the um, in the feedback form what you thought about the session. What do you think about the Padlet? Again, this is the very first time we're using Padlet, trying something out to stick within the time. And yet again, I am three minutes over, probably four minutes by the end of it. Uh, thank you all so much for the fantastic feedback in the in the in the chat as well, and for the interaction. The fact that you've you've actually um, uh, involved with our mentees that's fantastic. And all all the feedback. Please do let us know if there's anything, any other different types of sessions you would actually enjoy as well please do think about it and and, and let us know um thank you thank you all so very much the feedback is fantastic in the in the chat and i'm, I'm most grateful and i do hope the information is of help and i hope you you'll reach out to us uh so that so that we can properly heal based on a on a project by project and i'll complete the padlet um, and it will be made available as a pdf with all the other materials for the for the session as well in uh in your course no, thank you all ever so much. Uh, it, it was a pleasure to, to, to have such a fantastic audience today. Um, and once again, please don't, don't hesitate to reach out. With that, I shall wish you all a lovely Tuesday um, and we'll be waiting to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you all.